Welcome to Pottery Visited, episode 32. Today we are covering chapter 14 of Chamber of Secrets, Cornelius Fudge. Or, as we like to call it, an introduction to introductory courses. So we start the chapter off where the last chapter ended, where we find out that Hagrid was supposedly the person that opened the Chamber of Secrets, or so Harry believes, through Tom Griddle's diary. And so when it opens up in the chapter, Harry has explained this to Ron Hermione, and even though the evidence against him seems very damning, they all believe that he didn't have the intentions to hurt anyone because they know Hagrid and they're like, oh, if Hagrid was the person. Yeah, they absolutely see the best in Hagrid at all times. Yeah, they're like, if he did do it, it obviously was an accident. Like, he didn't do it on purpose. Absolutely not. He is the sweetest guy. Yeah, and they're kind of faced with the dilemma of wearing, like, do they bring it up to Hagrid or not? Because they care a lot about Hagrid and they want to know the truth, but also, like, they don't want to upset him because... Obviously, he won't talk about the reason he got expelled. So obviously, it's very a, a very embarrassing and personal and yeah, dramatic. I think it's funny how Harry's trying to like come to terms with the reality, and he's like, "No, maybe it wasn't Hagrid. Maybe Hagrid's monster was like just a different monster." Which, in fact, is the truth. Hagrid's monster was a different monster. And then Ron goes, "How many monsters do you think this place can hold?" And the answer is so many. <laughs> Too many. So they find out, kind of just giving an update, that it's been four months since just since it's been four months since Justin and nearly had the Snick were attacked. And we're at this kind of lull where there hasn't been any more attacks, so people are kinda of like, uh, oh, maybe it's over. And they were kind of hoping that they wouldn't have to talk to Hagrid because if there's no more attacks, then maybe it's over. But I'm just thinking, four Justin has missed four months of school, and we're thinking that Colin was attacked one or two months before Col before, before Justin. So that's like five or six months of school. I'm like, do their parents know? And I'm like, at this point, like, like their education is so stalled. Like they basically missed an entire year of school. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's sort of like the first three years at Hogwarts are kind of like primary school, where like as long as you catch up in math, it's kind of fine. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I love that they're talking about how the mandrakes threw a party in the greenhouse. A raucous party. I'm just trying to imagine a bunch of potted plants throwing a party and like loud rock music. And I love that for the mandrakes. I also think it's super funny that you can tell when they've reached maturity, when they try to move into each other's pots. It's like when you move out of your home you grew up in and you move in with someone else by choice, that's when you're a grown up. <laughs> If you're a mandrake. I wonder like what stage they start filing their own taxes. <laughs> when do they buy their first vacuum? I feel like those are other good uh, representations of once one has reached maturity. Very much so. So speaking of kind of like going back to like the school curriculum. So all the characters are 12 and they are given the opportunity or I guess where they have to choose what um, extra courses they're going to pick for their third year. Yeah. Which kind of reminds me of high school where like you were given a bunch of, at least maybe not, the, um, not like grade nine, because you have a basically grade nine is just like, at least in Canada where we were, it's just you have, kind of have like your mandatory courses and then you yeah. get, pick like one elective. But when you get kind of midway through high school, you're given more choices on what you can take. Yeah, I think in first year in ninth grade, the options were like, they were all mandatory courses. And then you had a choice between home ec and shop class, and then a choice between visual arts and music. Or if you got special permissions, you could take just the two from one category and neither from the other, which is what I did because... That, that's what I did too. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to learn to cook because why? And I didn't want to work with wood because why? So yeah, they're young, they're like 11, and they're choosing their courses. I think it's good and important that Hermione mentions that you can't get rid of any of your core subjects. You're just adding on some electives because I feel like 13-year-olds are going to, or 12-year-olds are going to immediately drop like the wizard equivalent of math. <laughs> yeah, they're going to be like, I don't want to take math. I don't want to take science, you know? Really important classes. Yeah. Same. <laughs> so it's kind of like, it's nice that they can't ruin their futures by being lazy in 12. Like they're like, you can... Well, the thing is like, yeah, because Ron's judging it. He said he wanted to drop uh, Defense Against the Dark Arts and Harry said he wanted to drop potions because they just don't like the teachers they have. But like those... Yeah, but it would have ruined their opportunities to become auras or do a lot of the things they end up wanting to do. But I just find it weird that, like, they don't really have, I guess, any guide about what the classes are. Like, Harry's getting advice from, like, Percy and he's explaining, but no one really gives, like, a description of the courses. So, like, when we were choosing classes, we had, like, a small description of, like, what the class entailed and, like, what your course, like, work would be about. 
Well, I'm sure they have a bit of that, like a description so much as like, this is what divination is. It's about the f- predicting the future and reading, t- you know what I mean? Like, I'm sure they have like a paragraph description of each. And in my mind, there's probably like an assembly or something that just like each teacher stands up and talks about their course for a bit. I, I mean, that's never mentioned, but I think just for it to be remotely logical, it has to happen. It just wasn't interesting enough for us to get told about it. I just feel it's, it's a very important part in like your education process is picking courses that like Percy and Hermione say, it's going to kind of lead you to like your future jobs and your future, like what you're going to get into because you have to have certain subjects to get into like yeah. certain owls and those owl marks lead into your new it marks and those loot marks lead into like what job you're going to go into. Yeah, I think it's like, it's the first time in like someone's life where they get to start making their own choice that impacts their future significantly because like up until course selections like your parents make all the important choices and in some cases I'm sure people's parents made their course selections as well but like it's sort of the first time like you get to choose and you get to start like to some extent picking a direction in your life you know like get me the heck out of math no I don't want to take physics they're kind of big decisions so I feel like I feel like also that they kind of go over this next year because Hermione picks all the subjects because basically they're saying like what subjects are you interested in taking and I feel like the next year they're like they kind of figure out how it's going to fit into their times table and obviously Hermione taking all those courses well, she should have not been allowed to take all of them. She'd be like, okay, these ones conflict, so pick between these two. Like when I was in college, we had specializations. So I really wanted to take the producing class, but it conflicted with my editing class. And at the time I was like, I'm going to be an editor. So I had to make a choice that I would choose editing over this other class because the time's conflicted because being at two places once, it's not possible. And I don't think we, I want it to be possible after like seeing what happens to Hermione in the next book. I definitely uh, think it's weird that they let her, I mean, maybe you fill out all the courses you're interested in and then they magically compare all of the times tables to see how they can arrange what time each course is that works best for the most students. And then they say like, sorry, you just can't take this one. If you want to be in this course, you have to drop the other thing you would want to be in at that time, pick one. And then with Hermione, they're just like, don't pick one, just time travel. It's cool. Yeah, I just feel like, because they're given like a very brief information and I feel like they haven't kind of figured out like the next year, like what the times tables are going to look like, like what cl- time classes are and who's teaching what. So I feel like what classes would you like to take? And then when they look, look into it the next year, like, okay, here's what your time table is going to look like. I'm like, but these two classes conflict. Yeah, I always thought what teacher taught something also made a big, like when I ended up taking business class and law class, I knew I would enjoy whichever one of those the uh, the history teacher was teaching because he was fantastic. But I knew they were giving the other one of those two classes to a teacher I despised and the office wouldn't tell me which teacher had which class. So I signed up for both knowing I'd really, really like one and the other one would be a shit show. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it matters. But I think at Hogwarts, it's pretty clear cut which teacher teaches which subject. Like when it comes to like the specialities, obviously they haven't really had experiences with those teachers yet. So they probably wouldn't even know like... It's not like you can choose which divination teacher you want at the moment. What would you take? What kind of uh, Hogwarts courses do you think you'd be interested in as electives? It's kind of like you say, like, I think divination sounds cool, but I don't think I'd want Trelawney as a teacher. I think divination sounds cool. I think I would take it because I'd love the idea of divination. And then if I had her as a teacher, I think I would enjoy the creative aspects of it. Like, because the way Ron and Harry sort of treat that class in the end is like a creative writing class. Yeah. (laughs) Or like an improv class. And I like those things so I would try to analyze my dreams because I love that I've always been really into dream analysis I have Young's collective work on dream analysis I've done dream journals I love that stuff but also I like the way you can handle that course if you're not taking it seriously as well it's just a good time I also feel like care much of a creature sounds cool except not when Hagrid's teaching it I feel like it's like kind of like a liability for like your life (laughs) yeah I feel like I love animals and love the idea of care of magical creatures I feel like when I think about some of the other electives I would take care of magical creatures as like a soft option just as like a this won't have a lot of homework option yeah I know like uh, Hermione takes arithmetic which I think is some kind of math yeah it's the magic of numbers yeah, and then she also took Ancient Ruins. I think Ancient Ruins would be cool. It kind of reminds me of, like, Egyptian hieroglyphs and stuff. And Yeah, I think I would l- love Ancient Ruins. Hieroglyphs, yeah. I took some archaeology classes that I really enjoyed. So I feel like 
that's the most similar. I would, I think I would definitely be interested in that. Okay. I think I would take ancient runes and divination as much as I love animals, but. Yeah. Okay. So moving on from courses, Harry's just going about his life and uh, getting ready for the Quidditch match for the cup. And Neville comes to find him because their dormitory has been ransacked, or at least his part of the dormitory has been ransacked for someone looking for something. And Tom Riddle's diary is gone. Gasp. I love how Ron's straight up like true crime detectiving it. He's like, the pockets are inside out. That means someone was searching for something. You know, like Ron's up there straight ready to solve a mystery. And I love that for him. I do like the idea that like, this whole mystery is that the Tom Riddle's diary is obviously very important. They know it leads to the Chamber of Secrets and Harry didn't want it getting out because he was worried it could go, it could backfire on Hagrid. And then yeah. there's the whole idea that like, who could have stole it? And they're like, it had to be a Gryffindor. So it's kind of hitting at clues that like, a Gryffindor could be involved. And it's kind of shocking because the Gryffindors are always the good guys. The idea that someone in Gryffindor could do something bad is so like such a new concept in the series. It's kind of uh, shocking. So you know that Ginny was the one that went back and stole a diary because she doesn't want, basically she was worried that Tom Burdell would sp- spill her secrets to Harry. But I was wondering, how did she get into the dormitory without being seen? Because I feel like the Gryffindor common room is always like really busy and there's always things going on. And I just feel like it's be very obvious to see like Ginny just hanging around there. So like maybe a lot of Gryffindors were out watching Quidditch or maybe she went during class time. Like when everyone else is in classes, she went to the bathroom and instead ran up and robbed Harry. I just feel like as Weasleys, like they're not really inconspicuous. Like everyone knows who they are and everything. Yeah. Red hair, shabby secondhand clothes. You must be a Weasley. <laughs> I mean, also maybe like, we don't know exactly how the layout works. Like maybe all of the like second years had class at that time and the first years didn't. So like none of the boys were in that dormitory because they're all in the same year, and so none of the boys in the other years would have noticed, because it's a different room. I suppose so. And if they saw her on the stairs, she could be like, oh, I'm just returning Percy's copy of how to be a perfect prefect, or whatever, you know? But uh, as they're leaving for Harry's important Quidditch game, he hears the voice again, and Hermione suddenly comes to the conclusion that she knows. She knows it! And she runs off. I also love that, uh, Harry says, what does she understand about Hermione? And Ron's like, loads more than I do. (laughs) Why didn't she just give them a hint? Tell them something. I hate when people are like, oh, I think I figured the whole thing out. So I'm going to run away and personally investigate, putting myself at risk without giving you guys the tiniest hint about like the thing. Like she should have been like, oh, maybe it's a snake. Because only Harry understands what the hell it's saying. I'm going to go investigate snake monsters. See you later. Like, I feel like Hermione does this a lot in the series. But she, it's just like, I think about it, like she processes this information. But she has to do it internally. And she won't verify anything until she knows she's right. Yeah, but sometimes it's to a fault, you know? Yeah, it does come back. Because, like, she, she never really explains herself until, like, she's ready to, like, and she's proven herself right. And she's ready to explain herself. But it's always after the fact. Like, She'll always be doing something here where be like, like what, like, spending with like uh, the Red Skeeter stuff that happens in Goblet of Fire. Like, she kind of does her own thing. She, she's like figuring all this out, but she doesn't tell them until she's she's figured the whole thing out. Like, she, she very much leaves them hanging. And I guess they're kind of used to it. But yeah, it's just, this feels like it was so, if she had told them what she was thinking, it could have like saved them some time. Absolutely. But that's Hermione for you. Yeah, I just feel like that gets. Just how she processes information, she has to do it herself, and she's just very, like, I don't know, just want to be proven wrong, probably. Like, I think, I don't know if that's, like, what she's thinking, but I think it's very subconscious that, like, if when she has ideas, she's like, I need to go look this up, but she doesn't think about informing Harry and Ron, because she's just like, I have an idea, I need to go do my thing. To the library. So when Harry goes to the Quidditch game, uh, McGonagall comes out and cancels it, much to Wood's disappointment, because he's like, Professor, a Quidditch Cup, like, come on, this is important. Top priority, Quidditch. But surprisingly, McGonagall's like, actually, Quidditch doesn't matter. And she grabs Harry and Ron, and it turns out that Hermione has been petrified. Yikes. I just feel like this is a really big blow, because we kind of realized, I talked about this a lot in the our last few chapter reviews but um Hermione's like been very essential to the trio and this particularly this book but it kind of this book kind of highlights 
how important she is and like how much they rely on her because this is the time where they have to kind of solve things on their own. And even petrified, she still helps them out. But like they're very aware of like Hermione being missing and like a gap in like their group. Yeah. It's both like emotionally taxing and stressful because they've lost their friend. And it's also puts a huge extra burden on their ability to like resolve the issues and solve things because Hermione's like the one that kind of does that. <laughs> it's tough. I also think it's it's very sad that uh, Penelope Clearwater is also petrified because poor Percy is going through so much. Like that's his secret girlfriend. So he's like probably so stressed, but no one knows that's his girlfriend. So like yeah. they just think, oh, he's upset because she's a prefect. And how could something like that happen to a prefect? And it makes me sad. Like poor Percy. Yeah, that's how Fred and George put it. And they're actually pretty, sen- they're pretty sensitive to him. Like they're all in the common room and... Fred and George kind of quietly tell Harry, like, oh, he's really upset because Penelope Clearwater got attacked and she was a prefect and he didn't think they, the monster would attack a prefect. But like, That's not at all it. It's literally someone he's incredibly close to. And poor Percy. You know what I mean? Like, no emotional support for Percy. I mean, again, they didn't know it was his girlfriend, but I feel bad for him. I feel like it's he's definitely very isolated a lot throughout the series. And I think this is one of those moments where I wish... I don't know, he had been shown a little bit more support. Well, like, he does keep himself to a lot to himself because looking at his younger siblings, like, obviously he's being, like, an older sibling where, like, you kind of keep things to yourself to spare younger siblings. Yeah, you want to help them solve their problems but seem perfect to them. But also he doesn't trust his siblings because his siblings are, like, he's he's very different compared to, like, probably Fred and George or, like, his closest siblings. Besides, like, Ron and Jenny are very much, yeah. Ron and Jenny are much very younger siblings, so he's more, like, a parent to them. But I feel like Fred and George would be, would be, if they were a bit more similar in personalities, he might confide in them, but he doesn't trust them. And they, he knows that they just he, may, he, he they would just make fun of him. So, like, it's unfortunate. But that's kind of, like, what, like, having siblings this is, like, when you're, like, in your teens, like... You're very, you're, you're, can, you can be close to them, but there's also, like, just things you wouldn't trust with your siblings because... At that time, it's, it's, your goal in life is just to make your siblings' lives hard sometimes. All right, Carrie, moving on to Hagrid's hut. They sneak out to talk to Hagrid because that was the plan. If someone else was attacked, we'll go talk to Hagrid. And the fact that that's Hermione does not cause a deviation in the plan. And Hagrid opens the door with like an arm. Like he's armed with a crossbow pointing at them. And they're like, what the hell, Hagrid? I mean, he's definitely probably jumpy because there's a creature going around attacking students. And he's probably jumpy because he knows what happened last time this incident occurred. And he probably gets a lot of people showing up at his door to be assholes. Like, realistically. I think he's definitely kind of expecting to be arrested or to get, like, questioned or something. So he's just kind of, like, preparing himself. I don't know why holding a weapon to someone who's trying to arrest you. I think that's the wrong way to go about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, like, I don't know what he was thinking, but Hagrid doesn't really think ahead in those situations. No, he doesn't. I'm like, he is, like, especially when he starts talking, he's like, oh, you know, you'll they'll be killings next. I'm like, Hagrid, the right to remain silent. He is so giving them cause to arrest him every time he speaks. I'm like, stop talking. Hagrid, no. He needs a solicitor. He needs a damn good lawyer, yeah. Well, Harry and Ron are there. They get put back under the visibility cloak because Dumbledore and Cornelius Fudge come. And this is our first time meeting the Minister of Magic. Yeah. And I think it's like very interesting, his character, because in this, he kind of says that he needs to take Hagrid in to show the, like, show the public that he's doing something. And he's not even really sure that Hagrid's like guilty or whatever, but he's just telling Dumbledore, well, I have to do something or it's not a good look. I mean, it's classic politics. You know what I mean? It's... He's a politician, and that's what he's doing. So we very much see that he's kind of like, he's not really a, a wizard compared to Dumbledore, but he's very much like a politician, and he's all about, like, good optics and stuff. And kind of, he's very, he seems very nervous with, with bad things happening, which happens when Lucius comes. So Lucius came to talk to Dumbledore because he wants to kick Dumbledore out of... Out of Hogwarts. Yeah. And Fudge is absolutely, like, not down for that he's like get rid of Dumbledore he's like no no I like Dumbledore Dumbledore solves things for me he does not like the idea of of Lucy is getting rid of Dumbledore Lucy actually says like oh this this power is with like the governor so you can't do anything and it's kind of is very stark comparison to Order the Phoenix where Fudge is very much in Lucy's pocket and like he just does whatever Lucy says 
So it kind of shows that, like, how things changed with, like, political landscapes. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny because, like, I feel like Dumbledore is the perfect person to have around if you're Fudge because Dumbledore is very competent and can do a lot and resolve a lot. But also he very specifically is trying to avoid having positions of too much power or being too sort of involved in things. So like Fudge probably gets to take credit for a lot of things that Dumbledore would resolve. And that's probably part of why it's sad that Dumbledore is leaving. A, he's leaving and the students are in more danger. And B, he not only could resolve the danger, but he could resolve it and let Fudge look good for it. Because Dumbledore is very like well liked at this point in the series. So like having Dumbledore around and like, we know that from like, points in the series that Fudge relies a lot on Dumbledore for just like, yeah, for just like guidance and like how to do things. And Dumbledore handles a lot of things himself. And yeah, it makes Fudge look good because everything is fine. But as soon as Dumbledore kind of goes against status quo and kind of disrupts the political landscape and doesn't make Fudge look good, then it's Dumbledore is bad. And we kind of see how Fudge kind of puts his position above kind of like the greater good of the wizarding world so hagrid always always helpful gives some very subtle and very not at all suspicious to fudge advice to the children which is follow the spiders i don't like spiders i think that is the worst advice anyone's ever been given even if i didn't know where that leads i don't love that advice i don't love that advice at all i find it interesting that uh dumbledore makes this big deal about loyalty and and uh kind of hinting from his talk with Harry earlier in the book about um, loyalty and phoenixes and just be there for do what Dumbledore wants kind of stuff. And he's definitely aware that Harry and Ron are there because he says that like, oh, I'm if those are loyal to me are still there, then everything will be fine. P.S. Loyal to me, Albus Dumbledore. Just cramming it down Harry's throat. Like, you need to be loyal to me and everything will work out. Yeah. So my question is, how does Dumbledore know Harry Potter is in the hut? Like, we know he's very magic, blah, blah, blah. But he's under the invisibility cloak, which we know is an incredibly good invisibility cloak. So I'm wondering if maybe it's using, like, occlumency? Like, he can he can sense Harry's mind there? Which then would then bring up the follow-up question of, can Snape also sense them when they're under the cloak? Because I thought it was a little weird, the timing of, like, Ron stubs his toe under the cloak and swears, and Snape sneezes just at that moment, so no one hears them. I don't think Snape would want them to be able to sneak out at night. But if Dumbledore had intentionally told him to do everything in his power to make sure Harry can sneak out to see Hagrid, I think Snape might have. Because if, to me, Occlumency is the only way to have that cloak still be impressively good and have Dumbledore know they're there. And I would say Sever Snape is on parallel Occlumency skill-wise to Dumbledore. So it's just like an interesting thing to think about if Snape can always know they're there every time they're under the cloak when he's looking for them like what does that change and how would that impact moments well I feel like there's times where Snape is aware that Harry has the cloak so he always assumes he's around but I feel like at this point like I feel like Dumbledore has like a good sense of it because we know he can he can be invisible without invisibility cloak and I just feel like he's probably also very aware that I think they are having tea with Hagrid so there might have been like teacups out okay so you just intuition. I just feel like he has very good intuition, but I do like the idea of like him being aware of Harry's mind. Because it's just like he's just like stalking him, basically. Yeah, he's like, ah, I can sense some minds in here. So I thought since we were talking a lot about Hagrid being arrested and everything, we could talk about the wizarding legal system, which seems very uh, odd. Yeah. I think it's so like we know a little bit about Azkaban, not so not at this point in the series, but in hindsight and we know that like the dementors are there i mean it's it's to an extent torture to be there because of what the dementors do to you and to me there are lasting repercussions even if you're there briefly you know what i mean yeah like it's traumatizing so it seems weird to me that you would send someone all the way to Azkaban directly from like taking them into like custody so like they take Hagrid into custody and then immediately bring him to Azkaban in my mind there should be an intermediary place where he's held and supervised and after he goes to trial if he is proven guilty then he should go to Azkaban because like the emotional trauma and like physical effects of Azkaban aren't easy to undo and if you send him there and then find out he's innocent like in a realistic world he can sue you for a butt ton of money (laughs) like yeah, I'm trying to compare it to, like, our legal system because, like, at this point, Hagrid would be, like, he couldn't be charged with, like, murder because they have no evidence. They just, like, know that he was, like, kind of 
he might have did it last time. So I feel like they could arrest him maybe under suspicion of, like, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, they do. It is a real thing. They will bring people to prison but um but but sometimes they will they'll they will bring people to like an actual prison when they're waiting to see a judge beforehand like just temporary whatevers but azkaban isn't even normal prison it's torture so it seems a bit um i don't know it just seems like a bad idea it seems like they're sort of the process the legal process there isn't very well fleshed out I mean, yeah, I feel like in the general world, our legal system isn't perfect either. But it seems really, really, like, flawed in the Wizarding World because we know that from, like, in the series that tons of people go to ask him without trials. Like, Sirius didn't get a trial. And it just seems very, like, it just seems very, like, unjust because the wisdom god is what's voting on it and not, like, an impartial jury. So it's just... Yeah, the wisdom god who has opinions and the sway and have similar mindsets and life experiences because they're all a bunch of old smarty pants. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it just seems. Yeah, it just seems very so uh, much for a jury unjust. of your peers. It also seems weird because like they have truth serums. Like Veritas serum exists. You know what I mean? It seems interesting that that just isn't a part of the process. Like. Yeah, I wonder if there's, like, a, the ability to, like, like uh, break through it. Like, kind of like how I would assume, you would assume that, like, if you can have a pen seep and see memories, that if you were charged with a crime, you could prove your innocence by, like, here's my memory of the event. But we know that memories... Yeah, I mean, and we know that, like, Slughorn can alter memories, but... Yeah, but memories can be altered, so that's why they're not believable. So maybe there's some people that are able to, like, modify or alter the truth serum so it can't be, like, held up in court. I mean, I guess, but even if we think about, like, polygraph tests, they're not always, ac- like, accurate. They measure your stress more than your guilt. And sometimes you're just very stressed because someone has been murdered or whatever. So I think, like, maybe it would be interesting to do the pensive method where you look at their memory and then also do the Veritas serum thing where you hear their truth and then look for more evidence. But, like, that could be, like, additional or circumstantial evidence. Because it seems like something they could do. And it feels like most wizards probably can't forge memories like that seems like a strong like there was like a little blip in the false memory that Slughorn created that you could sort of tell something was wrong there so I feel like especially Hagrid he's not a particularly competent wizard he doesn't have he didn't even finish his schooling so like he would be a good example of someone who's very unlikely to have the ability to alter memories or overthrow Veritas serum so it feels like that would have been an excellent opportunity to use those yeah, I feel like with the, the prison being basically torture, I feel like the stakes are very high. So I feel like you have to have all these avenues to prove innocence. Because I feel like sending someone to, to that kind of prison would be like a last resort. And they should obviously be super guilty. Yeah, it's like The Hague. It's like, I'm sorry you jaywalked. We're sending you to The Hague. Good luck. Like, it's crazy. It's absolutely bananas. It's the weirdest. But also, like, you don't really learn law in at Hogwarts. Like, are there lawyers? Are they just politicians get to decide the law is kind of how it seems like. Well, we know that the orders are, like, a part of, like, the, 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 like, the defense or, like, basically what our police system would be. Like, they're just, like, highly trained policemen, basically. So I'm assuming... Yeah, they're police. And police do not very different things than lawyers. You know what I mean? Like, it seems like there should be... Yeah, but I feel like within that department, there should be some kind of, like, defense lawyers. I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. Because isn't that what Hermione does after after she leaves school, is that she works with the Magical Creatures Division, but then she moves into the law so she can, like, kind of, like, correct the laws? So she's basically some kind of, like, DA, is what I imagined. Yeah. That's just attorney situation. I don't know if she's, like, writing laws or actually, like, participating in defenses or prosecutions. Like, we don't really get that much information. She'd be an excellent lawyer, though. I hope Yeah, so. everything's very big. That's kind of what I imagined her being. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Potter Revisited. Let us know your thoughts about uh, wizarding laws and the justice system. And you can reach us at Potter Revisited across social media. We'll be back next time to discuss chapter 14, Aragog. And we'll see you next time. Bye!